Hey, what's up, man? How's it going? What's the good word today? Peace, my Lord, be with you. Hey, what's up? How you doing today? Ma'am? Oh, oh, no way. Oh, you, you would star that movie that was going on last week. Oh, oh, it's so nice to get to meet you. How you doing? Oh. Well, the peace of the Lord be with you, too. Oh, man, you are moving. Oh, I was honored to get to meet you. You know what? Can I lift up a prayer, please? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all the good that you do, all the good ways that you guide us, that you lift us up. We pray that you would be here today and speak to us through your word and through the lives of those you've touched. Amen. Amen. All right, the hat will come off. <laughs> and so ends my tribute to the house. So that would be a common greeting in the house of the west side of Chicago as you walk through their doors on a Saturday night. Had I not added the scripture to my greetings to the uh, surprised handful of people this morning, what would you have thought? What would your first impression have been of somebody walking in like that? Got a screw loose? Okay. Yeah. What did you think? What was the first impression you had of the picture that I put up of my tribute to the house? Somebody throw it out. Rap. Rap? Okay. What's up? Homemade. Oh, Homemade. Oh, <laughs> Take a little closer look at it. I'm sorry. We rep Jesus in all five elements of hip hop. The house, teens and up only, advisory, explicit truth. Psalm 127 1. The house is a hip hop worship experience. Yes, the house is the name of the hip hop church of Chicago's West Side with Wandale Community Church. Had you seen that just really quickly, you may have thought, oh my god, my pastor's lost his mind, <laughs> putting a, an image like that up. Without the scripture in my greetings for those around, would you have recognized me as a Christian? Without the scripture, would you have recognized me as the one about to preach a sermon? But I am a Christian. I am a pastor and, yes, the one called to preach today. But in today's passage, there will be two people that we talk about that similarly miss what is right there in front of them. So let's read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. And this is verses 13 to 31. Now on that same day, two of them were, called, were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, was, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and of how their chief priests and leaders handed, them over to be, handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one who would re to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these events took place. Moreover, 
Some women from the group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should, should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village where they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now, now nearly over. So we went on to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as you can see, Easter didn't quite hit everybody with the empty tomb or the Easter story. These two, Cleopas and his partner, uh, unnamed, there is a bound about who it may have been, are making that trek about seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, probably their hometown. Chances are this Cleopas and whoever he was traveling with were, uh, if I can call them peripheral disciples, maybe one of the 70 rather than one of the 12, they probably had a bit of a motive as they were making the trek out of Jerusalem during the Passover feast. Thinking that the chief priests had just killed Jesus. The servant girls have tried to trip up Peter to reveal himself as a disciple. If we get caught as a disciple, who knows how the chief priests might try to clean house with us. And so they get out of, out of town. You notice the language that Cleopas uses when he answers Jesus. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. Not who was the Christ, not who was the Messiah, but was a prophet. One of those words that he can say and get away with it, stay under the radar of those who are trying to kill the disciples, even though, he, even though Jesus was considered dead, and was for a little while, the prophet title stays with him. It's not far off that he would be called a prophet, even though he, everyone thought he was dead. And as they talk, we talked about last week, we can, he can refer to them, he can refer to Jesus as a prophet without it costing him very much without raising the red flags that he might be one of Jesus' disciples. Of course, as they're going along, the Greek says they were having a heated discussion. Probably kicking the dirt on that seven-mile trek, saying, how could this happen? We thought Israel's Redeemer was so close. We thought he was right there. Now we've got to wait again. We thought Rome was going to get taken over, knocked out of our lives, and now it's over, and the hope is lost. Oh, how little did they realize redemption would be standing right there next to him, next to them. They certainly missed the boat as he approached, as Jesus approached. When Jesus says, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? What are you arguing about? What are you having this heated discussion about? I imagine these two coming out of Jerusalem are going, Oy, hey, is this guy a moron? Has he not heard of the biggest news in the world? Or in our city anyway? What kind of rock has this guy been living under for the last, couple, the last three days? 
He really didn't know what happened. To be sure, they were spiritually blocked from being able to recognize Jesus. It's the same with Mary Magdalene in, in John's Gospel. Uh, she sees Jesus standing on the rock and thinks, assuming he's the gardener, she tells him, please, if you've moved his body, tell me where he is and I'll take care of him. Not recognizing that it was Jesus there with her. As Jesus joins the discussion among these two, how do you think they saw him? What does his ignorance do to their perceptions of him as they talk? We know he missed the boat with the women. This is one that you may not quite get from the text, but the women, different women based on different accounts, get to be the first ones to witness, to experience the empty tomb. Get to see the stone rolled away, see the angel, see Jesus risen, hear the testimony of those angels. It's part of the evidence that I hadn't gone over last week about why we can assume that the resurrection story isn't just a made-up fairy tale. Because if you think about it, go back to the first century for a minute. Who were women in, a, in the court of law? Nobody. They couldn't testify. Their claims would not be counted for anything. It would be dismissed as, oh, it came from a woman. Never mind what she said. So if disciples are going to make up a story, make up a fairy tale, if I can call it that, about Jesus being resurrected, would they say the women came and told us about the empty tomb, about how Jesus was risen? No. That'd probably be pretty foolish writing if they were trying to come up with something like that. Who would make up a story with that kind of particular detail if it wasn't a true story? We know the travelers didn't believe the women as they were, they had probably been there hearing the testimony or at least word got down to them about the testimony of the empty tomb and everything like that. And yet as they're walking to Emmaus, in that afternoon period after the testimony had been given, they're sad. They're dejected. They're probably thinking, why, you know, we were so close. Redemption was right there in our hands and we lost it. Or it got lost. The beginning of this chapter, uh, the first 12 verses that I didn't read, actually talks about their testimony. Luke's version of it, saying, you know, the tomb is empty. We've seen the angel who said that he is risen. And yet the travelers are sad going home. <coughs> Why would they have been sad if they had believed the women and what they said? What does this say about their views of the woman's word? Did they think, Oy vey, you have lost your mind, woman. Maybe. What did they miss out on by not believing what they said? What hope, what encourage did they slough off as they sloughed off the women's testimony? Well, they certainly missed the boat with the scriptures as well. They, like everyone else, around, had their own ideas of what the Messiah was going to look like. He would be a king, he would be a general, he would be somebody political that's going to overthrow Rome, or at least get them out of Jerusalem, out of Israel. He'd be like Moses, who could go in to Pharaoh's office and say, let my people go. And God forbid the Pharaoh didn't or the Roman emperor didn't, there'd be plagues upon plagues cast on him, as, as Moses was able to do. Yes, it's one of those things that you've heard me say over and over and over again this Lenten season, harping on how, what Israel thought their Redeemer was going to be like. But it's critical to understanding 
the mindset of Gospel Times Israel, what they were expecting, how they read that first two-thirds of the scriptures, the holy writings. All of it they thought was going to lead to a specific kind of person, a specific kind of leader or savior. As Jesus even says, all the writings that he's going through his testimony, his teaching from Moses through the law and through the prophets, points to, according to Jesus, how all those writings point to a savior. But these two conveniently leave out considering the suffering servant part. The part that their Savior would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Probably because it wouldn't fit their image. What they had grown up for generations and generations thinking their Savior was going to look like. Jesus says in verse 25, He says to them, Oh, how foolish you are. Oy vey, people. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. That word foolish. In the New Testament, it has kind of a, a unique ring to it because most of the time that it's written, it speaks of believers. It's not like the, the fool of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament that say, you know, the fool is one who doesn't believe in God. The fool being an unbeliever. This is one that describes an individual, usually a believer, who sees things from a distorted perspective. Who looks at this Jesus, who doesn't know what just happened, with a distorted perspective? Who looks at the women who testified about the empty tomb, probably with a distorted perspective? Who looks at the scriptures as Jesus will lay them out with a distorted perspective? Trying to make them fit into what they think their Savior should be. And Jesus explains it. As one writer says, perhaps Jesus started with Genesis 3.15, the first promise of Redeemer, and traced that promise through the scriptures. He may have lingered around Genesis 22, which tells of Ab how Abraham placed his only beloved son on the altar. Surely he touched on the Passover, the Levitical sacrifices, the tabernacle ceremonies, the Day of Atonement, the serpent in the wilderness, the prophetic messages of Psalms 22 and 69, and yes, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. What did they miss out on when their distorted perspective said they had to look for another Messiah yet to come? Missing the one standing right there by them on that dusty road to Emmaus. At a certain point, Believing in the resurrection requires faith. These people had all the evidence. They had the scriptures. They had the testimony of the women. They had Jesus right in front of them, albeit they couldn't recognize him. And yet they still weren't believing. They were still walking to Emmaus sad. All of last week's evidences that I gave them, and many more that I didn't even touch on, they're not meant to paint somebody into a corner so that they have to believe, as though taking away their arguments is going to automatically turn somebody into believing their, as a Christian does. But instead, they're just meant to break down those barriers that get in the way of faith. These two were talking pretty heated as they walked along and Jesus joined them, and probably could have talked for days on end without coming to different conclusions because of that foolishness, that distorted perspective. What do our preconceived understandings make us see? What do you see when I wear a hat like this? Do you see Christian? Do you see pastor? Do you see master's degree? I won't end this sermon with the hat on for Joan's sake. <laughs> but amidst that, what do our preconceived mindsets 
make us miss that may be standing there right in front of us. In the name of the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you by example for working in ways that that take our preconceived notions and turn them on end. That take our assumptions, our seeing the book's cover and force us to look past it. Force us to realize that the stranger, the punk, the kid who makes all the noise as he's walking down the street may be one that would be like entertaining angels unaware. May we be able to look past the outside, look past those foolish, distorted views, and be able to see you in all that we meet, in all that walk alongside us. <coughs> Amen.